Good afternoon. On behalf of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled Success Stories from the ARC Medical Office Survey on Patient Safety Culture. My name is Teresa Famolero, and I work for Westat as the database manager for the ARC Surveys on Patient Safety Culture. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. We are very excited about today's topic and glad to see that you share our enthusiasm. If you need help at any time during this webinar, use the Q&A icon. You can also join us by phone at any time by dialing 855-442-5745. And entering the conference ID 87046239. Another common problem is having your computer freeze during the presentation. Hit your F5 button on your keyboard to refresh your screen. Remember, though, that you may just be experiencing a lag in the advancement of a slide due to your internet connection speed. You can also try logging out and logging back into the webinar. Before we begin the presentations, I'd like to introduce you to our webinar console. All the components on the console can be resized to fit your entire browser window. They can also be moved and minimized into the menu dock at the bottom of the console. If the slides are too small, click on the lower right-hand corner of the slide window and drag your mouse down to make it larger. We are pleased to offer closed captioning as well. To assess the closed captioning or access the closed captioning, please click on the icon, icon called closed captioning that is at the bottom of your screen view. After you click the link, a new window will appear displaying the captioning. I would also like to remind you that if you experience any technical problems, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to contact us with your questions. Our technical staff will work with you to resolve any issues. The last 15 minutes of this webinar is reserved for a discussion based on questions that you submit. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation. Simply click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Then type your question into the Q&A box and select Submit. We welcome your questions and comments on the upcoming presentation and look forward to an engaging dialogue. Today's slides are available for download by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen that says Download Slides. This will generate a PDF version of the presentation that you can download and save as desired. We also have additional resources available for you to access under the Resources icon. Here, you will find a link to the Medical Office Survey on Patient Safety Culture website, where you can download the survey, items and composites, and user's guide. Also on this website is a PDF version of a resource list for users of the ARC Medical Office Survey. This document contains references to websites that provide practical resources medical offices can use to implement changes to improve patient safety and patient safety culture. So for example, one of the online resources is the Team Steps Primary Care Master Training Course. Also available from clicking on the resources icon is a link to the 2014 Medical Office Comparative Database Report, which was released this past June. So I just want to cover some of the objectives that we will cover in this webinar which will include providing some background information on the ARC Medical Office Survey and patient safety culture as part of the Safety Culture Survey family. 
I'll be providing a brief overview of some of the results pulled from the 2014 ARC Medical Office User Comparative Database Report. And after reviewing highlights from this report, we will have the opportunity to listen to our speakers talk about initiatives and other activities implemented in their organizations to improve their scores on the ARC Medical Office Survey. So uh, you know me, I am Teresa Famolero, and I am the moderator today. And I'll be speaking a little bit about the ARC Medical Office Survey results. Then we have Juanita Stroud. She's the Patient Safety Director at Carolina's Healthcare System, located in Charlotte, North Carolina. Juanita has more than 15 years of experience in patient safety, performance improvement, and patient experience. She has been implementing the safety culture surveys system-wide since 2008 and continues on a biannual basis surveying hospitals, medical offices, and long-term care facilities. Juanita will review a number of initiatives implemented to improve and promote patient safety throughout her health system's many medical offices. Bev Benaro, who is our second speaker, is an RN and Director of Quality and Regulatory Affairs at Yuma District Hospital and Clinics in Yuma, Colorado. Yuma District Hospital and Clinics is a 10-bed critical access hospital and federally qualified rural health center. Bev has been with Yuma District Hospital and Clinics for 28 years, 14 years as a health coordinator, and 14 years in her current position. She has been administering the surveys on patient safety culture in the Yuma District Health Center for six years. Bev will be discussing how she and other facility leaders implemented teamwork-based strategies to improve patient safety and how the transition to a PCMH, or patient-centered medical home model, has led to improvements in patient safety culture. So today I'm just going to give you some background on the Medical Office Survey on Patient Safety Culture. The Medical Office Survey is part of the Surveys on Patient Safety Culture, sponsored by ARC, and it also includes other families of surveys for hospitals, nursing homes, and community pharmacies. These surveys and related toolkits are available on the ARC website that is noted on this slide. You can also link to the resources icon at the bottom of your console. Uh, just specifically, the medical office survey was designed uh, to measure the culture of patient safety in outpatient medical offices. Uh, it assesses staff and provider attitudes and beliefs about patient safety. And it also assesses some areas that are different from the hospital survey. The survey items are a little different. For example, we have work pressure and pace, which is different than in the medical office survey. The survey has um, 10 area or composites, ranging from teamwork, patient care tracking and follow-up, all the way down to work pressure and pace. We also have nine ratings on patient safety and quality issues, five ratings on information exchange with other settings, and five overall ratings on quality of care um, that match the IOM uh, dimensions of care, and then one overall rating on patient safety. The 2014 User Comparative Database Report is the second edition of the report. It presents data from 27,103 staff within 935 U.S. medical offices, and it contains comparative data from various medical office characteristics number of providers, specialty, ownership and region, and staff position. Uh, our medical offices collected their surveys by paper, web, and both paper and web. And as you can see, the majority of the medical offices, 83%, collected their surveys via web. Uh, the data submitted were um, collected by our medical offices between November 2011 and November 2013 and the average medical office response rate was 64%, with paper um, uh, being uh, the highest um, average response rate across the medical offices. This is consistent um, in the literature as well. And then we have an average of 29 completed surveys per medical office. 
here are just some characteristics of our medical offices. Uh, Forty-four percent of the medical offices, so not quite half, um, were had between four and nine uh, providers in their medical offices. The majority of medical offices that submitted as well were single specialty at 61 percent uh, versus 39 percent that were multi-specialty. And many of the medical offices that are in the comparative database report are from a hospital or health system. So we have 69% of our medical offices from a hospital or health system. Looking at the characteristics of respondents, uh, we can see that, that we have you know, variation in our characteristics of respondents with other clinical staff or clinical support staff um, showing us the highest number of respondents in the database at 34%. Um, and admin or clerical staff coming in second at 20%. And then again, um, the respondents with their tenure in medical office or their, you know, how long they had worked in that current medical office, we see some that we see, you know, decent variation there. And 11 years or more is the highest percent at 24% of our respondents. Um, answering that they had worked in their medical office 11 years or more. And here, uh, the majority of our respondents work 33 to 40 hours. It's 61% of our respondents in the database working 33 to 40 hours. So um, now I'm going to be going over the next slide, which um, has the medical office um, the medical office survey composite. And on this particular one, um, I'm not sure if you can uh, see this, um, see this uh, live, um, but I'm going to go over, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to go over that right now. So um, each of our medical office composites contains up to three or four items. Um, the percent positive response is calculated by whether a respondent answers agree or strongly agree to a positively worded item, and then disagree or strongly disagree to a negative um, a worded item. So um, just so you know, I, I'm not sure if you can see this, but we will, I will say it, that teamwork is coming up as the highest percent positive response in, uh, in the database. And teamwork measures the extent to which the office has a culture of teamwork, mutual respect, and close working relationships among staff and providers. And that was at 86%. Another composite that came up at 86% uh, positive response was patient care tracking and follow-up. And that measures um, the extent to which the office reminds patients about appointments, documents, and how well patients follow treatment plans, follow up with patients who need monitoring, and follows up when reports from an outside provider are not received. Let's go to the lower score, scoring composite. And that would be on the next slide. So one composite that stands out as an area for improvement is work pressure and pace with a 50% positive response. And work pressure and space measures the extent to which there are enough staff and providers to handle the office patient load and the office work pace is not hectic. So this composite has the lowest average percent positive response. The other one sort of clustered towards, um, you know, they had a different cluster anywhere from 68 to 70. Let's go to the next slide. Um, on this one, we're just going to speak about the overall rating on patient safety. Um, each respondent was asked to give um, a rating on patient safety in their medical office, and the majority of respondents um, answered uh, excellent at 28% or very good at 40%, making it 68% positive. So we're going to drill down a little bit into the results by medical office characteristics which I think will help you when you're comparing your medical office to other medical offices in the database. Um, just to be brief, on this slide, I'm just going to point out some large differences in percent positive responses 
across medical office characteristics. So for single specialty medical offices, pediatric offices responded more positively than hematology offices and showed the largest percent difference across all 10%, 10 patient safety culture composites. So respondents who worked in a pediatric uh, office responded more positively at 79%, while respondents in hematology responded positively at 68%. Respondents in health systems were more positive at 75%, while university, medical school, and academic medical institutions were less positive at 69%. And smaller offices with one provider were positive at 81%, while offices with 20 or more providers were less positive at 65%. The size is a big factor on the hospital survey as well, as smaller hospitals tend to be more positive than larger hospitals. So you can see it affects hospitals, medical offices, size is a big difference. We also had some um, other uh, uh, differences by staff position. So management responded more posit most positively across all patient safety culture composites. And the largest differences were seen in these two patient safety um, composites. So for communication about error, which assesses whether staff are willing to report mistakes they observe and do not feel like their mistakes are held against them, and providers and staff talk openly about office problems and how to prevent errors from happening, Management responded on average more positively at 84%, while admin and clerical staff responded on average least positively at 66%. And for communication openness, which assesses whether providers in the office are open to staff ideas about how to improve processes and staff are encouraged to express alternative viewpoints and do not find it difficult to voice disagreement, management responded on average more positively at 84%, while admin and clerical staff responded on average least positively at 63%. So we really encourage you to look at your results by staff position to view disparities in this positive response across the patient safety culture um, composite. So let's go on, and just as a reminder, um, you can download this information. I just gave you a, a splattering of, of, of the results from the ARC Medical Office Survey on Patient Safety Culture Comparative Database Report. But if you click on the resources icon um, uh, you know, in your web console, you'll be able to uh, download that report there. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to let you all know that our next open data submission for the Medical Office Survey on Comparative Database is October 2015. And for more information on submitting data, you can go to www.sopsdatabase.arc.gov. And for further questions on the data submission process, you can also contact us anytime at our database mailbox at databases on safety culture at westat.com or call us on our helpline at 1 888 324 9790. So now I'd like to thank you, and I will turn uh, this presentation over to Juanita Stroud from Carolina's Healthcare System. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, hi, this is Juanita Stroud, and I'm the Patient Safety Director at Carolina's Healthcare System, and I'm trying to get the slides caught up. Okay, I think we're here. I um, just wanted to start out today um, giving you a little bit of information about our health system. We're one of the nation's largest public not-for-profit healthcare systems. We have a full spectrum of healthcare and wellness programs. Um, throughout North and South Carolina. Um, we're quite large. We have 41 hospitals and over 900 care locations, 60,000 employees, and that includes full and part-time, and approximately 2,500 of those are system-employed physicians. Um, the next slide has our mission and our vision. Um, you guys can read through that. I'm going to keep going. And wanted to get into what we are all here about today, the AHRQ Patient Safety Culture Survey. Wanted to just start with a little background about our survey process. Um, we do participate in the hospital, medical office, and nursing home survey. Um, we conduct our survey every two years. Um, we do survey all sites, and we have a goal response rate of 75% of our staff and employed physicians will take the survey. Our surveys are web-based, 
and we coordinate our survey during National Patient Safety Awareness Week, which falls in March, and so our survey is offered during that time period. Um, each hospital long-term care facility and physician network assigns a contact, and that's who um, we work with in our quality department um, with that teammate to facilitate the survey. And about in January, we start announcing that the survey is coming in March. This is one of our tools that we use. Um, through our communications, corporate communications, we have Every Monday Matters, and this is a communication tool that we use, and it's sent out to every Carolina's healthcare teammate, and during the week prior to the survey, we send out this Every Monday Matters, and it specifically is talking about the patient safety culture survey and we give a little bit of information about what can they do, and the ask is that they take the survey. We also, in preparation for our medical office survey, we provide a toolkit. Um, the medical offices have a SharePoint site where we're able to um, upload all of our documents so that they have access to them. And what's included in our toolkit is the copy of the medical office survey so that they can share that um, so people are familiar with it. Um, we give past results it's typically from the previous survey. So in 2013, we provided 2011 results. Where were they? Um, we also give talking points, and the types of things that we cover in our talking points are the, um, some of the questions are negatively worded. Um, we tell them that the survey is confidential. We explain what neither means. Um, so those are some of our talking points. We provide that, and then each office manager during their um, leader meetings or their team meetings, they talk about, they use these talking points to help people come, become more familiar with the survey. We also provide a template for the medical director or the VP to announce the survey, and we ask that they include in that letter the actions that they've taken since the last survey to um, improve the patient safety culture. And then finally, in the toolkit, we also have some printable um, flyers that announce the survey. And I'm not sure if you guys can see um, the survey, the flyers, but the next few slides are a copy of the um, survey announcement. And we provide this electronic so that they can talk about the survey. It provides the link where they will take the survey um, with the web-based. And also, it just gives them why are we taking it to improve patient safety awareness, identify strength and areas for us to improve. We just really want our teammates to understand that um, why we're taking the survey, the benefit of it, and that we do use the data for improvement. And then once we take the survey, our next step is the sharing of the results. And we typically try to share within two months so that um, we can give that immediate feedback as much as possible. And we have a very um, large number of medical offices, so um, it's a real task for us to get these results pulled together so quickly. Um, and what we provide um, are statistics from the um, CHS medical office, and that's an aggregate of all of our physician networks. So as a whole, what do we look like? And then we break it down into each physician network. And then further, we break it down into each medical office. Also, we um, work with the patient safety group. And um, by doing that, we have access to survey results for each medical office. And they can customize additional reports to do a deeper drill down. So they can look at things such as um, um, what Teresa was talking about. They can look at it from their um, different providers, their different um, teammates within the network. We could look at hematology um, clinics across the various physician networks. So we have a, a real um, advantage there to be able to drill down that data. And then finally, our results are reported to frontline staff all the way up to the board. So we find that it's very important that we share these results and that we're transparent with it. And so once we get our data, then what do we do with it? Um, we start to identify trends. 
if there's opportunities for us to celebrate, we celebrate those trends. And then if we find opportunities for improvement, we begin our management action plan for us to address those opportunities. The management action plans are shared at what we call a um, QSOX and their quality and safety operation councils. And this is um, what we have within Carolina's healthcare system where we're able to do cross-network learning. We share best practices. So representatives from our various physician networks meet via video conference, and they begin to share best practices of what they're doing to improve their scores. And these are some of our scores. Um, and again, we take our survey every two years. So from 2011 to 2013 in teamwork, um, we improved from 80% positive to 93% positive. In communication about error, we improved from 53% to 72% positive. And then in communication openness, we improved from 50% to 76%. And some of the things that we um, implemented to help us with our improvement, at our Sanger Heart and Vascular um, Medical Offices, we implemented team steps, and that's through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and it's um, team strategies and tools to enhance performance and patient safety. And um, with this, our CMO actually required all our MDs to attend the training. And the MDs also assisted us. They became trained the trainers. And they assisted us with the presentations along with the other teammates um, within the area. Um, the strategies that we chose from Team Steps were chosen by the frontline supervisors. We did provide training to all staff and physicians. And then our leaders supported the use of the skills and strategies that were chosen. And if um, I think probably the first time that it was utilized, um, the MD um, did not support the employee's decision, but the leadership supported the staff because it was the correct um, strategy that they utilized. And, um, and the MD came back later and said, you know, you were right. And that just really helped move the initiative, and they really became a team and really worked together really well. And in, at Sanger Heart and Vascular, they have improved their survey on all composites. And then the next slide is for leadership support for patient safety. And with that, we improved um, quite a bit, from 45% to 80%. And some strategies that we implemented there, um, we've created something called patient safety champions, and others may have this as well, but it's each site has a ch champion, and that champion is the patient safety expert. And their role is to spread patient safety information. So if we come up with some best practices through the QSOC, then the champion's role would be to help spread that through their medical office. And then also the staff um, that are the champions are approachable and people can come to them about patient safety concerns that they may have. And then another role that they have that's not on here is that they do assist with the rollout of the patient safety culture survey. An additional strategy um, we call good catches. And a good catch is an error that is caught before it reaches the patient or a near miss. And this is something that we utilize to promote a culture of patient safety where we encourage um, and support non-punitive reporting of near misses. And we can submit our good catches electronically, and the good catches are shared for learning, and then they're celebrated as well. So we really try to make a, a big deal about the good catches, and also we want to look at those um, so that um, if there's processes that we don't want to reach a patient, if we start seeing trends, we'll address that. And then to keeping our pulse on the patient safety culture survey, this is something that we do this, um, so that we know, even though we only take our survey uh, every two years, we do look at how we're doing. Um, and the PERL survey is conducted periodically. It takes about four minutes to take the survey, and it concentrates on specific domains where we believe we have some opportunity based on our results. There's 21 multiple choice questions, 
And this helps us to gauge our progress and areas to celebrate. It identifies areas where focus efforts are needed, and it maintains an awareness of the patient safety culture survey. And this just helps us to, um, the next slide is for the um, flyer that is presented, um, posted. Sorry, I'll take it there. Okay, this is the flyer that is posted to announce that the survey is coming. We also have a toolkit with this as well, and it's posted on the SharePoint site. And um, our toolkit includes a timeline for implementation of the Pulse survey. It's a vice president letter of support. Um, there's a medical office leader letter that they can um, give to their staff and a brief PowerPoint about the Pulse Check Survey. And this is just an example of questions in the Pulse Check Survey. And this, again, just allows us to, as it's called, keep our pulse on how we're doing, and it helps us to know if we um, need to have some additional strategies to improve before we take the survey. And also, it allows us to celebrate and continue to announce what we are doing to improve. And I believe that's um, my slide deck. So I think we're ready to go to Bev. Yes, yeah, so let's go to Bev Fanaro. Thank you, Juanita. That was a great presentation. Let's go to Bev Fanaro from the Yuma District Hospitals and Clinic. Hi, uh, everybody. As Teresa explained earlier, um, we're a 10 bed critical access hospital with two rural health clinics. And we have participated in both the clinic and hospital medical office surveys. We're small enough that I hand delivered the surveys to each of the staff, including the physicians, explained why we participated and requested that they please take the time to do the survey. I put a large manila envelope at the nurse's station so it would be anonymous. When we received our results, I gave a copy to each of the providers and did a PowerPoint presentation with the nursing and office staff. We were pleasantly surprised by the significant improvements in several areas but most notably, patient care tracking follow-up, organizational learning, work pressure and pace, which is what we're focusing on today. This slide shows our patient care tracking and follow-up increased 38% between 2011 and 2013, which we attribute to the clinic staff's heightened awareness of the importance for tracking patient care and the implementation of patient-centered medical home in both of our clinics. The key factors with regard to the implementation of PCMH were, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the development of healthcare teams as opposed to a single physician and nurse, developed a patient navigator position, and the use of templates and tools for the patient navigator to use for patient tracking purposes. Next slide, please. We formed three healthcare teams. Each team consists of physicians, a nurse or MA, patient navigator, scheduler, and for the red and blue teams, a physician assistant. The blue team is Akron Clinic, which is a small satellite rural health clinic. The green and the red teams are both Yuma Clinic, and the green is the part-time providers and red full-time providers. Next slide, please. As a rural community, several of our physicians live in the front range and practice here part-time. At any given time, patients may see a different provider each time they come to the clinic. There was not a handoff protocol between the providers, so occasionally the patient's information between the patient providers was not being communicated to the patient's PCP. With the team concept, in the event of a patient's PCP is not available for an appointment, the patient will consistently see a member of the same healthcare team. The team concept ensures the continuity and quality of care for the patient and improves communication and handoff between the providers. Along with the healthcare team concept was the implementation of warning huddles 
involving the provider, nurse, patient navigator, and scheduler. And they review and discuss the day's schedule of appointments. They discuss whether, or I'm sorry, they discuss what the patient is being seen for, if there are labs, imaging reports, or report, reports from referrals, and if the patient is having a procedure, and what the doctor will need for that procedure. This helps to ensure the appointment goes smoothly and all the necessary reports and information is available and decreases delays by being prepared. Next slide, please. Our patient navigators play a very vital role in the continuity of care, tracking, and follow-up for our patients. The patient navigator conducts a pre-visit preparation. Typically, the navigator runs a report of the scheduled patients for the week, which is reviewed with the providers so the doctor can order lab work, x-rays, et cetera, before the next appointment. The navigator places the orders and contacts the patient to let them know the doctor wants them to have lab work before the next appointment. Navigators are involved in the morning huddles and they work closely with the physician and patient to develop an individual care plan, including treatment goals, educational materials, and additional support that's available through community services. The navigators help track the patients by reviewing and updating treatment goals at each relevant visit, assess and address barriers when goals are not met, inform the patients of tests prior to the appointment, and monitor that results are received, and they follow up with patients who have not kept important appointments. This is hard to read, but it's just an example of the patient navigator template, which the navigators use for the pre-visit preparation for patients with chronic conditions. And this template captures a lot of the information, but briefly, a few of the reports that are pulled for that are chronic problems, uh, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, the level of self-management, barriers, referrals, educational tools, a summary of the encounter. This is what we refer to as pink sheet, which is actually pink. And this was recreated by the navigators for patients with chronic conditions, currently diabetes and hypertension, and is used for tracking purposes. The navigator identifies that the patient hasn't been seen for a while documents the date of the last diabetic or hypertension visit and the current date. Then they document the date of the last hemoglobin A1C and lipids, the results, last blood pressure, and if a foot exam was done. The doctor also likes to know the date of the last basic or metabolic panel. The doctor reviews the sheet before seeing the patient. Then following the encounter, the doctor checks the time the next time that he wants to see the patient what labs will be needed, and any instructions for follow-up. The navigator uses the pink sheet then to document all this information into a spreadsheet she's created specifically for tracking diabetic and hypertensive patients. Additionally, the nav navigator created a spreadsheet to track what we call ticklers, which is an alert for the navigator or nurse <clears throat> that the doctor wants the patient to have a type of specific service, and this is not disease. Specific. The navigator keeps a tickler spreadsheet so she can track if the patient has been sent a letter if they responded or if a second letter is needed. If there's still no response, she calls the patient to see if there's a barrier preventing them from getting the service. All of this tracked through color-coded, very detailed spreadsheet. Additionally, the clinic nurses keep their own spreadsheets for tracking patients that have been referred outside the patient. This system has greatly decreased patients falling through the cracks. Next slide. Organizational learning. The, obviously, there was a lot of learning as we worked through new processes. We attribute our 30% rate of improvement on communication, training, teamwork, and weekly PCMH, PCMH meetings.
We have weekly PCMH meetings where we review and discuss new or tweaked processes. We ask each other what worked, what didn't, and why didn't it work. We review the data, which has been abstracted from the electronic health record, to monitor how we are doing and areas that may need improvement. In looking at what didn't work or what may need improving, we do a process map to identify where processes may be breaking down or bottlenecked. From here, we discuss possible solutions, develop new processes to be taken back to the clinics for implementation. During our next weekly PCMH meeting, we'll follow up on those new processes implemented during the week, review the data, and go through the same process again. Reports are presented to the Quality Council and are shared with the clinic staff, providers, and board. By implementing healthcare teams and fine-tuning our processes, we've seen positive results in the area of work pressure and pace. They improved by 29%. The healthcare team concept and implementation of patient navigators alleviated some of the pressure on the clinic nursing staff by allowing them to work at the top of their license. Before this, the nursing staff was responsible for all the phone calls, tracking reports, putting in the lab and the x-rays, and follow-up on ticklers, etc., for all clinic patients. Through the processes we implemented, we have seen improvement in the working relationships between clinic staff and providers. Our staff are working at the top of their license, and our morning huddles have our teams prepared for the patients coming in that day. Our patient navigator focuses on tracking and monitoring patient information, allowing our nurses to follow focus on the clinical aspects of care. The team concept is very important, and no one person is responsible for the care of the patients. The patient is the team's responsibility. In closing, by implementing patient-centered medical home concept, we've seen improvement in our safety culture survey results, improved continuity and quality of care, improved communication, increased patient satisfaction, and increased employee satisfaction. Care coordination does require additional resources, such as health information technology and appropriately trained staff. Obtaining PCMH recognition would not have been possible without the support of administrative staff and our board of directors. And thank you. Great. Well, uh, this concludes uh, the presentation portion of our webinar. Uh, we are looking to respond to any questions that you may have regarding the presentations and any aspects of the medical office survey on patient safety culture. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, you may click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your console to submit questions. And also at the bottom of your screen, there is a survey icon. You can click on this at any time to access the webinar evaluation survey. So uh, before we get to your questions, we have a few additional items to review. Uh, if you are interested in receiving email updates about the surveys on patient safety culture, including announcements about future events, uh, visit the ARC website at www.ahrq.gov and select Email Updates from the top navigation bar. And you'll be able to sign up to receive updates for any or all of the safety culture surveys. And lastly, uh, please feel free to contact us by email or phone with any questions you have about the medical office survey. Uh, you can see that we have our email and phone line up there on the uh, slide for you. And we're now ready to begin our question and answer uh, session of today's, of today's program. So let me go over and I'm going to start asking you some questions. Here's a question um, to both, uh, uh, to both uh, Juanita and to Bev. 
Uh, do you report the safety culture results to the public? If not, any plans to do so in the future? This is Juanita. Um, at this time, we don't report our survey results to the public. And to be honest, I'm not sure that we've thought about it. So I think that's a, a good point um, that I can take back to my leadership so that we can determine if that's something we would want to do. Okay, great. So um, that's good to know. Um, the next one would be um, to, uh, to both speakers, again, did you use um, incentives to get uh, to increase response rates? This is Bev, and we did not. We just, um, share, by sharing results, we hope that they'll participate and recognize the value of participating in the surveys. Um, for Carolina's healthcare system, um, at the end of the survey, they can pr print a participation form and um, turn that into their champion or their um, office, and then have a drawing for a prize. Okay. And then here's um, another uh, question to both of you: um, If a mistake was made that may possibly affect the well-being of a patient. Does your organization actively share this issue with the patient? Is openness to patients being stressed by your employees? Um, at Carolina's healthcare system, um, we do have a policy. We work with our, our risk management, and typically it's risk management and the provider or a leader would um, share that with the patient. And this is Bev. And we have a transparency policy as well, and uh, it's the provider is the one to share that information with the patient. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go to uh, something for Juanita. Um, here's a question for Juanita. This is, is the survey mandatory, and do offices receive a notification to comply? Um, it is not mandatory. Um, we do encourage it. We have a 75% um, particip participation rate goal, and so it's highly encouraged, but it is not mandatory. And what was the second part of the question? Uh, is the survey mandatory, and do offices receive a notification to comply? Um, we do have the VP letter that we would send out um, to encourage their participation, and then the office manager also has a letter that they would send out to encourage participation. Okay. Um, here's another question. I think it actually applies to both both of you. Um, what prompted your decision to do the survey every year or every two years? Every two years, for example, with mm -hmm. you, Juanita, instead mm -hmm. of annually, and then Bev if you could also um, respond to that as well. Um, for, for Carolinas, um, part of what our, our research, and actually was on the um, AHRQ website, was that culture change typically takes 18 months to three years. And so um, since we felt like offering the survey annually, we may not have enough time to actually implement our changes and to see the fruit of that labor, we decided to um, offer the survey every two years. And uh, the same with us, we decided that there wasn't enough time in between getting our results back and then uh, doing the survey again. And the every two years seems to work well for us. It gives you time to, to put in the initiatives and to see the fruits of your initiatives, it sounds like. Yes. Okay. So here's a question for Bev. Um, Bev, what are the qualifications to be a patient navigator? Well, our patient navigators are medical assistants, so they ha they need to have a, some medical knowledge and have worked with patients before. One of our navigators is bilingual, and um, they need to be pretty team focused. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, uh, this is a question for both. Regarding the gap in management versus frontline perspective on communication, what does this mean to each organization? What are the next steps? 
Hmm. We don't specifically have anything. Um, we take the results are shared with um, the leadership team to kind of break down and look for barriers and um, issues that can be easily resolved. The results are also shared with all of the the staff that are involved in those surveys, and we request their input as well. Um, at, at Carolinas, I, I believe that by having the patient safety champions and allowing um, staff to go to them to share concerns and that they can bring that forward to help um, bridge that gap. And also the Pulse Survey, and on the Pulse Survey, again, um, we have a free text opportunity where they can um, communicate additional concerns that maybe the frontline people are seeing that our, our leaders may not be aware of. Got it. So um, I, it sounds like you're trickling these results down to down to everyone. Um, you said something we, about the uh, Pulse oh, Survey. Oh, sorry. Um, we also have an employee committee, um, which is no managers allowed, and it's one employee from every department is required to participate in that. And they also look at some of this, and the especially the gap between um, leadership and employees, and try and, and look for ways that they think will bridge that gap, and then share that result those results with the leadership. Okay, well that's great. So um, this is a question for Juanita. Um, besides Every Monday Matters, uh, what types of publicity communication flyers have you used, and can you share them for other organizations to use? Yes, I can share. And um, we really used a, a variety of tools that we had. Um, we have an intranet. Um, where we were able to put post a patient safety page, and we would go on that page. We would list some things that we've done um, for improvement of patient safety within our organization. Um, we'd also, because we did tie it into Patient Safety Awareness Week, we would post um, you know, videos that we've created um, on hand hygiene, um, medication safety, some things such as that. Um, we create flyers that um, we send out in the toolkit. We place it on the SharePoint site so that um, the office champions or the office leaders can print those and post them. And, um, and then just within the various department meetings or medical office meetings, again, they talk about the survey and share information there. And typically, uh, most clinics will post the actual survey um, prior to the um, time period that we offer it, just so people can become more, more familiar with it. That's great. So you have a great dissemination strategy going on there. Yeah. Um, so Bev, uh, getting back to you, what is the ratio of patients to navigator? Oh, that is a really good question, and I don't think I can answer that right now, but I can get that information and um, send it back to the Safety Culture email address and see if I can get a response for you or that. Okay. That would be great. Um, Here's a question for both of you, and I think this is really a very good question, is how do you manage involvement of physician response rates in the survey? Or invo manage involvement of physicians, and how do you increase their response rate in the survey? Historically, um, ours well, has been low. Oh, go ahead, Bev. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> um, for us, we had a pretty good physician response rate, and because, again, we're small enough, and I know all the providers, and I hand deliver it to them and ask them if they would please make sure and, and do it, and it's anonymous, and that then I kind of check in, you know, a little, you know, a week later or so to see and kind of just remind them to make sure and get it in if they haven't done it yet. And so far, they're, they've been uh, participate pretty much 100%. Great. Yeah, for us, um, 
basically the same thing. It was a lot of reminding, a lot of um, don't forget to take your survey. But because ours is electronic, um, we did find that many surveys asked to have the survey sent to their home address. And um, so we would send a link to their home email address and um, they would take the survey on their own time at home. And um, so I think that was really helpful. Um, we started getting the requests and then we started getting more requests. So they just maybe have more time at home. Okay, this is a question um, for both of you as well. Um, since both of you do participate in both the medical and um, hospital and medical office survey, do you think that the staff that are in the medical offices feel that the medical office survey better addresses patient safety issues than they may see, for example, using the hospital survey? So we just want to know how is your staff's reaction basically to the medical office survey? Um, for me, it's for Caroline's healthcare system, um, we do, it is challenging at times because we may have someone that provides services within the hospital setting and then they provide services in the medical office as well. So we typically ask that they take the survey that is most relevant to them where they spend majority of their time. Mm -hmm. And if they spend the majority of their time in the medical office, I, I believe they feel that's a better survey for the services that they provide. If they spend more time in the hospital, then we would ask them to take the hospital survey. That's great. <laughs> I'm not sure if that right. really answered the question. <laughs> Our providers do work for the hospital as well. They cover ER. They admit the patients and, and take care of their patients as well as seeing them in the clinic. And I have them actually participate in both because the challenges between the two are there's going to be a difference. And they're pretty good about participating. Yeah, because culture is really, um, it's not always, it's not necessarily at the person level, it's really at the, the unit or the location level. So that could also, that approach could also work as well. Right. And then um, I do uh, have a question for both of you. You did mention um, on your presentations how you shared results um, with your staff. Do you ever focus on one domain at a time or, you know, or one uh, patient safety culture area at a time, or you just go over the whole thing, or do you ever revisit the results? Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the audience. If we're presenting to our board, then it's a very high level focus. If we're presenting to the frontline staff within a medical office, then we do start breaking, um, drilling down into the domains. Um, even to you know the type of staff that may have scored higher or lower. So for us, it depends on the audience, but we would do it both ways. And we just uh, should go through the entire report with the uh, the staff, and the board gets a, a copy of the entire report, and as well as the leadership. Okay. Well, um, let's see. I think we have some other uh, more questions still coming in, so this is great. This is a question um, uh, for Bev. Um, uh, somebody wanted to know how you refined your processes because they liked um, how you scored, yet made such an improvement on work pressure and pace. But um, uh, but she wanted to understand a little bit more of, you know. Basically, how you refine your processes to increase that that complete that domain specifically. Well, they all kind of do tie in together, and, and I think that the patient navigator has been pretty essential in that because after the implementation of that, um, having the patient navigators is when we start seeing the improvement in that as they took on more of the responsibilities for kind of tracking the patients and thus the the clinic staff is working at the level of their license and they're not um, having the responsibility of all of that for the patient. And so that kind of took the pressure off the clinic staff while the navigator assumed 
some of those responsibilities. And there's also, you know, good communication between everybody in the clinic, and the morning huddles has helped with that as well. That's great. Um, here's a question, I think, for both of you. Um, did you – I just wanted to just double-check. I think some of them initiatives you were talking that you did across the board, but did you pilot test your initiatives before you rolled them out? Um, with our team steps, we did do a, a subgroup and um, and then rolled, had the success and then rolled it out. So um, some we piloted and some we went full throttle. Okay. And ours was, uh, I guess you could call it a pilot. Um, you know, it would be implemented and it, having weekly meetings to discuss those initiatives and looking at what is working on what is not, and then trying to fine-tune those is how we were able to get those through or not, you know, change processes because it wasn't working. Okay. Well, there's, uh, I'm afraid at this point we're out of time and we have to bring the webinar to a close. I'd really like to thank our presenters, uh, Juanita Stroud and Beth Zunaro, and our audience for being on the call. Uh, please remember to complete the webinar evaluation. It helps us to improve our offerings and future events um, that will meet your needs. Uh, so thanks again for joining us, joining us today. Thank you. Uh, I also would like to say that uh, Juanita's flyers will be available um, afterward as well. We'll be contacting her and getting those flyers to share. Thank you.